Uh, the committee will now come to order. Um, the committee is meeting today to hear testimony on HR 560, legislation I introduced to address the loss of the humanitarian parole that was granted to certain long-term Marianas residents by the Obama administration. We will also hear from our witnesses about the impacts on the Mariana Islands and Guam um, on the removal of the Philippines of, as one of the countries eligible for the H-2B worker visa program. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chairman and ranking minority member. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Additionally, I ask unanimous consent that I will, will have two additional opening statements uh, after the chair and the ranking member uh, make their statements, the committee chair and the committee ranking member, full committee ranking member, will also make opening statements. Without objections, so ordered. Before we begin, I want to thank Chairman Rihalva for making insular policies like those on today's agenda a matter of full committee jurisdictions. This was what's called the Interior and Insular Affairs Subcommittee. So we're really returning to a tradition that recognized the importance of almost four million Americans who live in non-state areas of our nation. I also want to thank my fellow members of the, the committee's Democratic Caucus for selecting me to be Vice Chair for Insular Affairs. Within, with insular affairs, issues raised in importance and with a representative from one of those insular areas, the Marianas, driving the agenda, I look forward to a very productive 116th Congress. Last but not least, I want to remind everyone of another tradition of this committee, taking a bipartisan approach to insular policy. We saw that bipartisan commitment demonstrated by Chairman Bishop last year when he pushed my Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce Act over the finish line. I remain very grateful to him, and he certainly has my commitment to continue to work, the bipartisan, to use the bipartisan approach to insular policies that is so clearly demonstrated. I just sometimes don't get his jokes. When this committee passed and Congress enacted Public Law 110, the Sue 29, to extend U.S. immigration law to the Marianas, Congress explicitly, explicitly stated the intent to minimize potential adverse economic impacts. In accordance, the Obama administration, beginning in 2009, granted humanitarian parole to certain CNMI permanent residents and their immediate relatives immediate relatives of freely associated states and U.S. citizen caregivers, and U.S. citizens, caregivers, and certain stateless residents of the Marianas. Their circumstances have not been taken into consideration in Public Law 110-229, and their presence in the Marianas in many cases had important economic effects. Unfortunately, on December 27, 2018, the Trump administration announced the termination of this Marianas-specific parole policies without warning and gave those Marianas residents previously covered 180 days to leave the Commonwealth or find some other status. H.R. 560 would reverse the Trump administration decision and provide permanent status in the Marianas for those persons as well as for certain long-term workers and investors. I want to make clear that, as with my previous bills on this subject, H.R. 560 only covers people who were lawfully admitted to the Marianas and who have remained lawfully present throughout the first, throughout their time of residence. No amnesty, HR 560 provides no new eligibility for public benefits and adds no new societal cost. Instead, by stabilizing the population and the workforce, HR 560 will have a positive economic impact effect. At this time, I request unanimous consent to add to the record a February 21st letter to Chairman Grijalva from Assistant Secretary Christine uh, Sicone expressing the Department of Homeland Security support for passage of H.R. 559 and saying the administration has no concerns on this matter. The same letter was sent to Ranking Member Bishop and myself. HR, like H.R. 559, like 560, provides permanent status in the Marianas, but only to those who are losing parole 
not to long-term workers and investors. Nevertheless, I thank the administration for this partial support. The Trump administration also announced a month ago that it was removing the Philippines from the list of countries eligible for AIDS visas. This decision is effective nationwide, but it was made without consideration of the Marianas. The Northern Mariana Islands U.S. Workforce Act, which I mentioned at the outset, this committee so successfully through to enactment last year, specifically relies on unlimited H2B visa work holders to supplement the Marianas workforce as the number of CW Commonwealth only transitional workers is reduced over the next decade. The elimination of Philippines is essentially poor time as reconstruction from recent typhoons is undertake underway and there is critical need for construction workers to repair and rebuild homes, schools, and infrastructure. Guam, our neighbor to the south, is likewise facing difficulty in its civilian construction workforce and its healthcare industry due to a labor shortage that is exacerbated by the new federal restrictions on Filipino workers. Information we received today will inform the committee and will inform legislative action if necessary on the visa waiver issue. And I look forward to working with Chairman Grijalva and my committee colleagues to mark up H HR 560 quickly and move it to the floor. I now recognize Ranking Member Gonzalez for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ranking Specifically, uh, talking about insular affairs. Uh, I want to thank you, Chairman, uh, Vice Chairman Sablan, uh, and I want to congratulate you for your first, uh, in your first role as uh, Vice Chairman of the Committee for Insular Affairs as well. And I look forward to be working with you the issues, not just for the territories, uh, but all, all other important issues for American citizens as well. Uh, I want to thank also all the witnesses that are here today, the governors uh, from Guam and the governors from Northern Marianas, uh, as well as the rest of the uh, witnesses here. I know most of you travel a long distance just to get here, uh, so we do appreciate that. And I would like to begin um, first for saying that the territories, uh, all of us, compo uh, are composed of more than 3.5 uh, million American citizens. Uh, so we should be uh, not just take it as, a, as an afterthought, but as an important matter uh, for the U.S. And among these issues that we can include in, in, in this kind of hearings is the need to accelerate disbursement for disaster relief funds, uh, addressing high energy uh, prices across the island, along with a long list of inequities that are, are represented for the territories as well. Uh, today. We must also ensure that all U.S. territories are not uh, just an afterthought, but are, are properly heard when crafting federal policies and legislation. Equality and fair treatment for all Americans will be my guidelines as, uh, and principles as a Republican leader uh, in, in, in this uh, committee. I also trust that Vice Chair uh, Sablan will, will do the same thing. Today we'll be discussing H.R. 560, legislation introduced by Mr. Sablan, that will grant uh, CNMI only residents status for non-migrants who came to the Northern Mariana, Marianas for work, many of whom came to the islands prior to the territory status. As been well known and documented Northern Mariana Islands workforce has historically been composed of both U.S. citizens as well as non-immigrant temporary foreign population. Until 2009, the CNMI controls its own immigration policy for the foreign workforce. Today, the Department of Homeland Security managed the application and eventual permits for any foreign people entering the CNMI for work. Since 2009, the CNMI only transitional worker program was, was forward looking, which left a certain portion of the existing former foreign workforce residing on the islands for many years, just in a gray area. Today, HR 560 is an approach to resolve any uncertainty for the certain long-term foreign uh, people. I, I do realize as well that as the Vice Chairman uh, Sablan introduced uh, two versions of this bill, H.R. 559 and uh, H.R. 560. 
The bill uh, before today includes granting CNMI resident status to a larger number of long-term workers. We look forward to having an open discussion and on which uh, approach we will be best for the people who now call the CNMI their home. And again, I will thank the witnesses and all the members of this committee uh, for allowing us to be here today. And I look forward uh, to hear not just their testimonies and their views on how we can best aid the Northern Mariana Islands. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, um, at this time, I'd like to recognize um, the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Grijalva, for his opening statements. Thank you, just uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman and uh, the ranking member. Appreciate the hearing and uh, looking forward to it and thanking the witnesses as well and yield back. That's a great opening statement, thank you. And uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize Mr. Bishop, the committee ranking member. That's kind of you, I, I just want to, I'll be briefer than Grijalva was. So, Governor Torres, we've worked before in the past. I appreciate all your efforts. It's good to meet the governor. Of Guam, I'm interested in your testimony. I want to make sure that we make sure that the economic viability of, of Guam and the North Marianas is secure going forward into the future. So thank you for holding the hearing. Let's get on with it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Um, uh, uh, thank you, and I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Um, the Honorable Raf de Leon Guerrero Torres, my governor of the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. Welcome. The Honorable Lou Leon Guerrero, Governor of Guam, our southern neighbor, uh, not necessarily our southern territory, but our neighbors, good neighbors. Uh, welcome, Governor Guerrero. Um, uh, thank you, governors, for making the long journey to be here today. Mr. Nicola Pulanik, Director of the Office of Insulars, U.S. Department of Interior. Nick, thank you for joining us. And of course, uh, always welcome Dr. David Goodnick. Uh, the Director of International Affairs and Trade, U.S. Government, uh, GAO, Government Accountability Office. Dr. Gunnick, always good to see you, sir. And uh, uh, witness, Mr. Michael S. Sablan, uh, CPA, and Vice President of Finance and Administration of Triple J Enterprises. Mr. Sablan is here testifying as a private citizen and not on the behalf of Triple J or any organization. Uh, he was was previously the public auditor for the Commonwealth uh, government as well. So under our committee rules, oral statements are limited to five minutes, but your entire statement will appear in the hearing record. The lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left, and then turn red when, red when time is expired. After the witnesses have testified, members will be given the opportunity to ask them questions. And the chair now recognizes the Honorable Raf de Leon Guerrero Torres. Governor. Of a day and Tito. Chairman Grijalva, our Congressman Kelili, Vice Chair and Ranking Member Bishop, and all the members of this committee, thank you for your time you have provided for this hearing on HR 560 and the ongoing issues relating to CNMI's complex transition into the US immigration system. I am here once again in support of HR 560 and ask for this committee's consideration and support of its passage. Issues with, the, with immigration are the greatest determinant of the CNMI's success today. We live, in an, we live with the intended and unintended consequences of Public Law 110-229, which took that control away. It is our responsibility to do what is right with an effort to melt three decades of local control with 10 years of experience within the transition period. To me, that is what HR 560 seeks to accomplish. A simple recognition that the transition period created 11 years ago was not a finished product, and that we shall share the responsibility to recognize areas of additional concern and rectify them in good faith with the best interests of the people of the CNMI in mind. <clears throat> the solutions presented in HR 560 are important, but only comprise a piecemeal effort to respond to the unintended consequences of the transition period. The CNMI labor force does not have suitable amount of US workers to do the skilled construction work necessary to grow an economy or perform needed infrastructure development projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
In 2017, H.R. 339, the Northern Mariana Islands Economic Expansion Act, was signed into law. The ability to petition construction workers to perform work in the CNMI under the CW1 program was prohibited. We were told that this should be of little concern as the construction needs of the Commonwealth could be met sufficiently by the H2B visa program. However, the Department of U.S. Department of Homeland Security recently provided a new interpretation of the H2B program, effectively removing the eligibility of general contractors from applying and receiving labor. Now, in order, for, in order to obtain a foreign construction worker, a business must apply for the worker directly. Small businesses and homeowners do not have the ability and are left with no legal option to source construction labor. Further, the removal of the Philippines from the list of eligible source countries for H-2B labor has further limited legal avenues for foreign workers for CNMI and Guam. We saw the issues almost immediately after the enactment of 339, but the situation today is far more dire. In 2018, we got hit with the super typhoon U-2 hitting the Marianas at 180 miles per hour and stayed on the island for 12 hours. Out of four out of every 10 homes in the CNMI were destroyed or suffered major damages. Across the island, you will see rows of FEMA issued tents and families sheltering their children and their possessions next to the shattered remains of their home. A construction effort is needed to secure the safety and well-being of these families in a scale never seen before in the CNMI since the end of World War II. But we simply do not have the means to do so. After Typhoon U2, FEMA and the Department of Defense recognized the challenges of performing their necessary work for the American citizen living in the CNMI by seeking out new and innovative solutions to conform to our unique circumstances. If it were not for the 200 men and women of CBs and Red Horses mobilized after the disaster, 184 homes in Tinian will still be without roof over their heads because there's simply no construction workers there. And by the way, we have our mayor of Tinian here. The CNMI does not wish to be a problem for Congress to solve, but arbitrarily policies have once again brought us before you today. I am not here asking for financial support. I am asking for your understanding and your permission to make do with limited options available to help our people succeed. I am not asking for a new solution, but replication but replication of concepts Congress has already employed. It was under the previous provision and interpretation of U.S. Public Law 110-229 that, that the CNMI's economy grew 28% in 2016 and 25% in 2017. We should adjust, amend, and, rec and reconsider our action and efforts to provide more for those in the CNMI living far be below the standard of our larger American community. Your support in the HR 560 is a monumental step toward that direction, but I ask that it will not be the end of these conversations. We must continue to recognize when federal actions come into conflict with realities of life in the Western Pacific. As it work, and as we work together on these islands and issues, I hope to gain your understanding that the needs of the U.S. territories require treatment unique to them not as a matter of preference, but as a matter of necessity. Thank you, Sisus Masis and Gelisa. Um, thank you very much, um, Governor Torres. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize for five minutes the Governor Leon Guerrero of Guam. Half a day and thank you for the opportunity to present testimony to this committee. I'm Lou Leon Guerrero, the first female governor of Guam, and as I have said before, it's been now 52 days of my administration, and I still love my job. So that's a good thing. As you know, Guam is among the most patriotic places in the entire country. Per capita, we have one of the highest enlistment rates and veteran populations in the nation. We support the military buildup and the economic impact it will bring. But it must be done at a pace that will benefit our local people, 
our island and the U.S. military. The Department of Homeland Security's recent administrative action that removed the Philippines from a list of countries eligible for the H-2B program effective on January 19, 2019, affects us greatly. While the new policy provides the U.S. citizenship and immigration services with discretion on a case-by-case -case basis, to approve H-2 positions that serve the national interest, including petitions that qualify under Section 1045 of NDAA. It is clear, though, that the ban on foreign skilled labor from the Philippines is having a detrimental impact on Guam. The cost of construction has increased. Cost of homes have increased by 45%. We have already experienced the impact that a loss in skilled workers has on our island. Beginning in late 2015, USCIS seemingly arbitrarily denied nearly all H-2 petitions in Guam, which previously had routinely been approving at a 95% rate resulted. This resulted in severe shortage of skilled foreign labor for the island's construction industry. From an average of 1,500 foreign workers nearly every year to the blanket denials, the H-2B workforce dwindled in two, to 252 in 2017, and in May of 2018, Guam reached an unprecedented zero H-2B workers on the island. The fiscal year 2019 NDAA partially addressed this issue through Section 1045, but such language primarily was passed to ensure that the U.S. military and its projects funded by military construction dollars maintain access to foreign labor. However, uncertainty of approvals on the civilian side has led to delays in ongoing projects and discouraged contractors from bidding on new ones. This scenario has driven up construction costs, shifting, stifling private sector development, and causing irreparable harm to our local community and our economy. Specifically, DHS, cited a national 40% overstay rate and a high volume of trafficking of visa holders from the Philippines as reasons for the country's removal from the programs. This is not the case in Guam. The island's rate of H2B workers who intentionally overstay is negligible, and there are no known trafficking cases involving Philippine <coughs> citizens. For decades and up to Day, up till today, Guam understands that our location provides our country with a valued location in which to monitor and project military force in the Asian Pacific region. Whether one agrees or disagrees with U.S. military presence on our island, it is inarguable that we possess strategic value and contribute to the national security of our nation. Because, because of this, I submit to this committee that Guam's economic security is equally important to the country's national security. For many years, this committee and the Congress has worked to develop policies to assist all territories develop our respective economies. Today, I present to you that the more than $8 billion of U.S. military construction dollars is gener generating considerable interest of others to invest in Guam. We welcome this interest and want to capitalize on this opportunity to increase the quality of life for our people and our visitors and the military men and women who call Guam home. Along with our military partners, we are taking a one Guam approach. However, not everyone in the federal family is on the same page. Segregating our community to further the perception of inside the fence and outside the fence attitudes do not work on an island who is 30 miles long and eight miles wide. As Congress considers the 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, I ask for legislative or administrative action that Guam, along with our sister territory of the Northern Marianas Islands, be exempted 
from prohibitions in accessing foreign labor from the Philippines. As one Guam, all projects on Guam must be considered as associated with the military realignment and under Section 1045 of the NDAA. I respectfully request that further amendments to Section 1045 be made to allow for the approval of workers from the Philippines, notwithstanding the regulations associated DHS's H2B approved countries list. Thank you so much, and I know I have gone over my five minutes, but we traveled the furthest and spent a lot of money, so I think we deserve two more minutes. Thank you. I want to thank you very much. We, we do have your full statement also, and so, uh, and um, I, I, I know fully your, your concerns. Uh, but at this time, uh, I'd like to uh, recognize um, Ms. Mr. Pula, Nick, would you, you have some good news for us probably? <laughs> Our chief advocate in the entire federal government? I'll try. All right, thank you. <clears throat> You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman <clears throat> Saplan, Rank Member um, Gonzalez Colon and members of the committee, Good morning, I am Nicolau Pula, Director of the Office of Insular Affairs for the Department of the Interior. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's thoughts on immigration matters impacting the Northern Mariana Islands. The Office of Insular Affairs does not develop or regulate immigration or labor policies in the territories. Therefore, the department has no position on HR 560. I understand that the Department of Homeland Security sent Chairman Grijalva a letter on behalf of the administration in support of H.R. 559, legislation similar to H.R. 560 and also sponsored by Congressman Saplan. Today, I will speak generally to the importance of immigration and investment in the Commonwealth of the North American Islands. The Office of Insular Affairs is responsible for administering the federal government's relationship with the territories of Guam, American Samoa, the United States Virgin Islands, and the CNMI. My office also administers and oversees U.S. federal assistance to the freely associated states of Federal States of Micronesia, Republic of the Marshall Islands, and Republic of Palau under the Compact of Free Association. In short, my office strives to foster economic opportunities, promote government efficiency, and improve quality of life for the people of the insular areas. The Northern Mariana Islands began its governance under the covenant to establish Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in political union with the United States of America and the CNMI in 1978. While the CNMI has experienced short periods of economic success, such as those associated with the garment industry. By 2009, all the garment factories were gone and the CNMI government fell on hard times. It became clear then, as it remains true today, tourism and the businesses that support visitors to the Commonwealth are key to its future and a healthy economy. To ensure its successes, the Commonwealth needs access to a strong and reliable labor market for the construction and reconstructions of hotels and tourist-related businesses, including a budding game industry, as well as access to utility workers and to a reliable healthcare workforce to maintain an adequate hospital and clinic system. The supply of United States workers in the Commonwealth will not meet the need today or for the foreseeable future. As Congress recognized last year when it significantly raised the annual numerical caps for foreign workers under the CNMI-only CW program and extended that program as well as the CNMI and Guam exceptions to annual limitations on H-1B and H-2B foreign workers through 2029 to address that concern. In 2008, Congress passed the president and president signed the Consolidated Natural Resource Act, uh, CNRA, of 2008. Congress expressed in the new law its intent that the executive branch should minimize, to the greatest extent practicable, adverse effects on the CNMI's economy development potential or its fiscal sustainability from facing into federal responsibilities and policies over immigration in the CNMI. 
In 2018, Congress again recognized the need for CNMI to sustain its labor force by passing the Northern Marianas U.S. Workforce Act of 2018, Public Law 115-218, which extended the important immigration transition program provided under the CNRA. As part of the act, Congress directed the Department of Interior to report by October 1, 2019, describing our fulfillment of responsibilities to provide technical assistance to the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in the following three areas. One, to identify opportunities for economic growth and diversification. Two, to provide assistance in recruiting, training, and hiring United States workers. And three, provide such other technical assistance and consultation as outlined in the Section 702E of the CNRA Act of 2008. We expect to meet this deadline. In closing, today, billions of dollars are being invested in casino and hotel facilities for which construction workers are likely to be necessary. Having experienced the devastation of three super typhoons in four years, reconstruction is critical, not only for the private sector to sustain itself, but for the government of the Commonwealth to endure. Tourism dollars are essential to the continued recovery of the Commonwealth. Without a sustained labor force, projected investment in the CNMI likely will wither. I appreciate the opportunity to provide the Department of Interior's views on these important issues, and I'm prepared to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Pula. Um, um, and at this time, I'd like to recognize Dr. Goodnick. Um, Dr. Goodnick, you're always a fresh face on every appearance. Just to give you a little a warning, um, we're working on a bill that would require your, you and Emil's uh, guidance uh, on future efforts, but uh, thank you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Sablon. Thank you for that warning. <laughs> Vice Chairman Sublon, Ranking Member Gonzalez Colon, and members of the committee, thank you for asking GEO to participate in this hearing. It's already been stated that the intent of the CNRA back in 2008 was, amongst other things, to minimize any adverse economic consequences of ending the pre existing locally administered foreign worker program. Since 2008, GAO has examined implementation of the transitional worker program. And we've also monitored DHS use of parole authority, permitting temporary stay to certain CNMI residents. GEO's work is based largely on our analysis of record level USCIS data. And in my remarks, I'll try to highlight the aspects of our work that track most closely with key provisions of HR 560. First on the CNMI economy. The Commonwealth's GDP fell sharply after 2007 and only returned to its 07 level in 2016. Growth and overall employment rose markedly in 2016 and 2017, and the demand for CW work permits met or exceeded the cap on permits for the first time. Under separate federal legislation, the minimum wage more than doubled from 2007 to 2018, when it re then reached the federal minimum wage. 2018 GDP is likely to be impacted by the reduction in available CW permits and the impact of Super two Typhoon U2 in October. The typhoon damaged homes, infrastructure, and according to the Visitors Authority data, created a temporary though significant decline in tourism. Regarding foreign labor, more than a decade after passage of the CNRA, the Commonwealth remains dependent on foreign workers. GEO's analysis of the most recently available CNMI tax data finds that foreign workers were over half of employment in 2016. In 2017, GEO modeled GDP under a range of assumptions of labor and output, and at that time, we found that if all CW workers were removed from the labor force, the most likely result would have been an economy 37 to 50 percent below its 2015 level. HR 560 would provide CNMI resident status for CW workers with continuous employment from 2015 through the end of 2018. Of the roughly 9,000 workers with CW permits in 2018, about one third had continuous CW employment going back to 2015 and would be eligible to seek resident status under H.R. 560 if other conditions of H.R. 560 were met. Last year, we reported that over 80% of long-term workers were from the Philippines. 
than regarding DHS removal of the Philippines from H-2B eligibility. With the reduction in the cap, the number of CW worker permits declined by roughly 4,000 in 2018. At the same time, the number of workers with H-2B visas increased from virtually zero in 2017 to over 3,000 last year. Nearly two-thirds of these H-2B workers, roughly 1,800 workers, are in the construction trades. As you know, the Workforce Act established restrictions on CW permits for construction, and this appears to have caused large construction firms, among, amongst others, to move to H-2B visas. DHS removal of the Philippines from H-2B eligibility will make it more difficult to hire construction workers for rebuilding in the aftermath of the typhoon and for continued hotel construction. On the end of discretionary parole under HR, under HR 5, on the end of discretionary parole, under HR 560 would establish CNMI resident status for individuals whose parole status was terminated in December 2018. This includes persons who are CNMI permanent residents at the start of the transition, those that were immediate relatives of U.S. citizens at the start of the CW program, the group of stateless individuals, and certain in-home caregivers. Excuse me. According to USCIS data, 1,039 individuals in one of the terminated parole categories were living in CNMI at the end of last, last year. That's 1,039 persons. The vast majority of these individuals are immediate relatives of U.S. citizens. In fact, according to CIS data, roughly 90% of persons paroled at the end of 2018 are parents, children, or spouses of U.S. citizens. Under 560, some of these individuals will be eligible to apply for permanent CNMI resident status. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gutnick. Uh, um, your um, comments and testimony are always very much welcome. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Michael S. Sablon. Uh, Mr. Sablon, uh, you have five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, Ranking Member, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify this morning regarding H.R. 560 and recent decisions in the application of federal immigration law. My name is Michael Sablon. I'm, I'm a certified public accountant and the Vice President for Finance and Administration for Triple J Enterprises. We are among the larger businesses in the CNMI, Guam, and the Micronesia region. Our operations include car dealerships, car rentals, restaurants, wholesaling, retailing, and we are heavily engaged in real estate development. Group-wide, we have 861 employees, 280 of which work in our 15 Saipan businesses. I understand I have been invited because I can bring a business point of view to the discussion this morning, but I have also served as the CNMI Public Auditor for over eight years with responsibility for the effectiveness, efficiency, and integrity of the CNMI various uh, agencies, so I bring that perspective to bear as well. Many of us in the islands often view the federal government as a distant force, unfamiliar at times with the unique challenges that make up our community, and in many respects, the immigration decisions under review this morning confirm that view. I am sure that there are many in the federal government for whom the Pacific Insular areas do seem a world away and uh, inconsequential. With 15 time zones and 30 travel hours between our islands and Washington, D.C., we, we are a world away. But today we can feel less incons inconsequential, less misunderstood, when our own congressman shares responsibility for federal policies in the islands and can offer legislation affecting the impact these policies might have on the CNMI. We commend Congressman Sablon for calling today's hearing and for his hard work over the years addressing the unanticipated consequences of Public Law 110-229, which extended federal immigration to the Northern Marianas in 2009. In the last Congress, thanks to his collaborative efforts in the U.S. House and Senate, and strong support from Governor Ralph de Leon Guerrero Torres, the CNMI legislature, and the CNMI business community. Uh, two laws were passed in the U.S. Congress that refined and extended the CNMI transitional worker program for another 10 years. 
We in the CNMI business community are grateful for everyone's efforts. And we as we recognize, it is not easy to pass immigration legislation, even in the best of times. Uh, thank you, Congressman Sablan. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you, Governor Torres. The business community appreciates your efforts. As reported by the GAO, U.S. workers represented 25% of the CNMI's total labor force in 2006. Ten years later, this ratio of U.S. worker to foreign worker doubled from 25% to about 50%. However, despite our continuing best efforts toward transitioning to a U.S. labor workforce, our businesses remain dependent on foreign workers to fill in the gaps where there are no U.S. workers available. Our experience at Triple J indicates slightly better results. Ten years ago, 70% of our workers were foreign. Today, 70% of our workers are U.S. But as we have found, the remaining 30% foreign workers gets difficult tougher and tougher each year to renew, uh, to replace with U.S. workers, because many of them have unique skills, many of them have been embedded in our businesses for decades of employment, that they are most difficult to find U.S. workers to replace. Many of them are long-term workers, that Mr. Sablan's H.R. 560 would provide improved immigration status. This would in turn provide stability and certainty for businesses across our community and our economy in general as it would also provide stability and certainty to hundreds of contract workers who have been with us for years who never know from year to year if they can con continue to live and work in the CNMI or have to leave. Triple J and the CNMI business community urge you to pass H.R. 560 and provide CNMI only permanent status to these workers and other categories of individuals covered by the bill. They have dedicated many years of service to our community to our businesses and are respected among us. Our businesses need them, our government needs them, and it is the right thing to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Wow, just perfectly timed, Mr. Salban. Thank you. Um, uh, at this time, I'd like to um, ask unanimous consent that um, we include in the record uh, a letter to me from Governor Raftors, a letter to the Chairman Raul Grijalva, copy to, uh, also to Ranking Member uh, Bishop from uh, Christine uh, Sicone, um, providing support. Uh, and uh, the, numbers of, uh, um, the numbers involved are covered by HR 560. Uh, a total number of 3,970. Uh, a letter to me from the Saipan Chamber of Commerce. A letter to me from uh, Hanmi. And a letter to Ra Chairman Raul Grijalva and to me from uh, uh, a group of attorneys. Uh, one, two, several attorneys. Uh, if, without objection? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we will not have an objection, but we would love to have copies of the last three letters you just mentioned. We don't have it. We will make sure that the members get it. Uh, and at this time also, I'd like to use the chairman's um, discretionary prerogative, if I may ask, to recognize um, a former colleague, a long-time colleague, and actually an individual member who once chaired the subcommittee, including the insular areas, uh, Congresswoman Madeline Bordalio. It's good to see you, Ms. B. Uh, so, um, at this time, uh, each member will, will have five minutes to ask uh, their questions. Um, um, the chair will now recognize the members for questions. And under committee rules, rule 3D, each member will be recognized for five minutes. So I'd like to recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Governor Torres, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Department of Homeland Security has given their support for HR 559, despite that we prefer HR 560. 
uh, and which provides permanent status for about 1,039 people in the Marianas who are losing their humanitarian parole because of a, uh, the Trump administration decision. But the administration is silent on HR 560, which also covers 2,875 long-term workers and 55 long-term investors. Now, I know that when you engaged in what we call Section 902 consultations with the Obama administration, you reached agreement, actually, uh, that long-term workers should get permanent status through legislative action. And I understand uh, this week uh, you began 902, Section 902 consultations with the special representative of President Trump. So my question is simple, will you, get, will you work to get the Trump administration to agree to permanent status for long-term workers as the Obama administration did? And if so, will you get the Trump administration to support my bill HR 560, which does just that? Well, let me go ahead and, and say this, Congressman, and thank you um, for this opportunity. I've been a, a strong supporter for long-term status, um, regardless of which administration. Uh, that's just the right thing to do. Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, I have done that in the past since I was in the Senate, and I'll continue to do that. We have been working with the administration, um, issuing uh, our concern and echoing the importance of having our long-term uh, citizen um, grant their citizenship in the island of Saipan. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Torres. I take that as a yes, so thank you. Yes. Um, uh, Mike, Mr. Mike Sablon, um, uh, one of the effects of HR 560 is that about 2,900 foreign workers who have been living uh, year to year on CNMI work permits would be able to get permanent status in the Marianas. In your testimony, you mentioned the uncertainty that their impermanent status creates for them. But it must also create a great deal of uncertainty for businesses like yours and like those that have members or representatives uh, in the room uh, that employ these uh, CW workers. Uh, our Republican colleagues often talk about the importance of providing certainty to businesses. Would you be able to say a few words about what the uncertainty of the current foreign labor program means to businesses? It must stifle your ability to uh, grow, and would my legislation improve the situation for your business? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as with any other business, all our, all our projects, all our development projects are, are long-term in, in planning, and uh, uh, labor, especially in the service industries that we are in, labor is a critical component to success in our business. Uh, the, the challenges that we face with uh, finding qualified U.S. workers continues to be a challenge every year. We've, we've done a tremendous job, I think, in, in being able to recruit more U.S. workers, as I mentioned in my testimony. We have, we have reversed that worker mix from 70% uh, uh, contract workers to 70% U.S. workers, but the challenge continues. Uh, and for businesses like us where we have uh, feasibility studies that require multiple years of, of, of success in the business to recover our investment. Uh, uh, not knowing whether we would have these workers available to work in our companies over the, over the you know, five to six year term of our recovery period is, 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 is difficult. Uh, we, we stress every year, uh, we go through a lot of stress and, um, and uh, uncertainty, not knowing if we have the workers. And, uh, your bill, 560, that would provide uh, long-term permanent status for our, our long-term workers would be a big help. Uh, many of them have, have dedicated their, their, um, their services for many years in our companies and have proven to be great assets. Uh, uh, certainty in any business is a very critical component to success, Mr. Congressman, and I hope that the committee understands that and, and helps help our businesses with, uh, with uh, you know, our ability to continue operating. As you know, without labor in the service industry, uh, we don't have any business. Yeah, all right, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sablan. Uh, at this time, um, I recognize for her questioning, uh, ranking member and colleague, Ms. Gonzalez Colon. Thank you, Mr. Sablan. Uh, thank you again, all the witnesses for coming here. Um, 
I think there, there are several issues here. First of all, I think nobody will be supporting families for being separated, right? So taking that as a standard for all of us, uh, we, we must follow the law as well. So we need to search what are the differences uh, between the, the law provided in 2009 uh, allowing uh, this kind of group and, and, and how it was implemented. Uh, the reality is that sometimes the administration just looked to the other side and, and provided just a blanket and we need to follow uh, and if we need to correct that here, this is a, this is a place to, the place to do it, and I, that's the reason I do understand. This is not the first time a bill like this has been has been uh, dropped. I mean, uh, Congressman uh, Sablan has has done the same thing uh, in, in the last uh, two Congresses, I, I believe, uh, supporting for a long-term uh, solution for for, the, for this situation. Um, specifically, I think we should uh, take, uh, you know. In, in, in advantage uh, was the position uh, of the Homeland Security. Was, what's the reason uh, for moving and executing uh, in a different way? And you established in your, in your uh, statement uh, that this is regarding uh, the, because of the uh, long overstayed period of uh, people that were staying from the Philippines uh, more than 40% of them were staying a longer term. Uh, uh, and, and I just want you to comment on that, Mr. Pula. Um, if you saw the letter from Home, Homeland Security. Yes, we, we saw the letter from Homeland Security, um, which they support the 559. Um, so, as you know, um, Within the administration, um, the Department of Homeland Security uh, deals with immigration mm -hmm. on these issues. Our department, as always, have been a department that advocates for the interests and the concerns of our territories. So within the family, uh, we have discussions and uh, we do our best um, to make the points and the concerns that are raised uh, by, by Mr. Pula, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, are you aware or do you know the reason of why more than 40% of the H2B overstate rate uh, visas for the Philippine people working or not? Oh, I do not. I'll okay. have to defer per to it. That, that's, that's, uh, sure. uh, that's something we, we should, I mean, what's the, the reason uh, for that and how long? Uh, those people are overstaying. So with that, in, in that term, I would like to go then to Governor Torres and first of all, uh, thanking you again. And I know how difficult it is for me working after the devastation of the typhoon Yudu. Uh, coming from an island that just suffer uh, hurricanes and uh, we're still in the recovery process. I, we know how difficult it is for all the territories just to handle uh, those kind of difficult situation, those disasters. Uh, and not having senators as well to help us out in that way. So um, knowing that Northern Mariana workfo Ireland's workforce has historically been heavily uh, reliant on foreign workforce. Um, if the, your administration has been working in any way to, uh, uh, to move that trend to a more, uh, having more U.S. workers in the island? Uh, what are you doing? Uh, you just... Uh, said that you were working uh, with the administration to have a waiver uh, of the situation. Can you comment on that? Well, and thank you. First of all, thank you again, and thank you for coming to the islands, and you can see Saipan and Tian and, and the Marianas Island, and thank you for coming down. Um, our issue there is, yes, we do, but I want to emphasize this. We have more U.S. Work, US workers today than we've ever had in the past. So, and then also, I just recently signed a law to turn our trade institute into my executive branch. We're working with PSS, our public school system, to make sure that we educate and train our students from seventh grade forward to fill in those occupations on our workforce. The bottom line, uh, Dr. Gunnick is here. We don't have the workforce to, to do the recovery. I was actually was talking to your governor, Rosello, the other day about the importance of recovery. We have a population of 55,000. You've been there. Puerto Rico has close to $3.5 million. I know what I'm going through in the islands, and I just want to say this for the record. FEMA and the Department of Defense have worked tremendously in addressing our recovery. 
and I think it's a learning process from Puerto Rico and Virgin Island. Um, but we have, I mean, it's a long way of recovery, and that's why this bill is such a critical bill, because recovery is not just a year or two years. There's more than 5,900 homes that were, that were determined as damaged by American Red Cross. We had more than 200 airmen and women from CBs and Red Horses that did a temporary roof repair. 184 of those are from Tinian and the rest from Saipan. So again, even if FEMA is going to give us hundreds of millions of dollars to repair infrastructure or homes, well, if we workers. don't have the workforce, there's no need to give us a penny. So again, I thank you for this. This is a very critical uh, bill, and I thank you, and I urge everyone here who have not been in the Mariana Island, please come so you know what we're fighting for, for our people. Thank, thank you, you, Governor. I know my, my, my time has concluded, uh, and we do have a, a lot of questions uh, in terms of how we can pursue and help in, in, this, in this issue to solve the long-term uh, problem, that, uh, the gray area that has been for many years. Uh, so with that, I yield back. Thank you. I uh, thank the ranking member. At this time, I'd like to recognize the full committee chairman, uh, Mr. Grahalva, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sublan. Uh, Dr. Kutnick, uh, given you know, the topic of immigration as a, as a generally is a, creates a firestorm anytime you get into that whole discussion given the tenor of the times. Uh, so let me ask you a couple of basics. Will the enactment of H.R. 560 provide a U.S. immigration benefit to persons covered by the bill? Question one. And will it mean that they will be able to indefinitely live and work in the mainland of the United States? The question uh, for your response, doctor. Uh, H.R. 560 would not confer U.S. citizenship, and it would not permit res residence or work in the mainland United States. The bill's intent is to provide a, C, a permanent CNMI resident status. Uh, there was an allusion to uh, the 902 discussions earlier in the questions. I, you could go all the way back to the, uh, the, envision, the envisionment of the CNRA when it was first established. It in part recognized that this issue and directed the Department of Labor to do a study on this. Uh, under Assistant Secretary Babauta, a report was produced that provided consideration for a number of options for the individuals who are considered under 560. One of those considerations was uh, CNMI okay. permanent resident status. So this legislation is uniquely tailored to the situation uh, in terms of that workforce, period. This legislation would only affect Got it. individuals in the CNMI. Thank you. Uh, Governor Guerrero, uh, you described a, a disparity in the treatment of the ability to access Filipino H-2 construction workers between U.S. military on Guam and the civilian government that is facing the same uh, shortage. Could you explain that uh, disparity and uh, consequences of that? Yes, sir. Um, there was a provision in the NDA Act that allowed for 4,000 um, H-2 workers to be approved uh, for Guam, but it is only for military projects, and that's what I was referring to. So you can have H-2 workers come in, but it's only for military projects and cannot work in the civilian projects, and that's why I make the statement, and I met my position is, all projects in Guam are military al aligned and will improve our economy. The military travels on the same roads that we travel, the military uh, accesses hotels that we also access and our tourists access, but um, if it's not a designated military project, then you cannot um, bring in H2 workers. So that's the disparity, so I'm asking that um, through your goodness, yeah. make an amendment to allow these H-2 workers for civilian projects also. It does create a division because then it's being referred as inside the fence and outside Got the it. fence. And it's, they're all in Guam. Exactly, it's 30 miles long and eight miles wide, so. Um, and thank you for being I here. I totally appreciate agree. It. Appreciate it. And, uh, uh, appreciate your, your 
your testimony. Governor Torres, uh, in the letter to Vice Chairman Sablan, uh, the Saipan Chamber of Commerce states that, that it supports H.R. 559 and H.R. 560 because of the long-term benefit. Uh, uh, and uh, can you elaborate on the integral role these long-term residents, and that's what that letter makes it a point, that they're an integral part of, that, of the community, uh, uh, have played in shaping your community, and, this, and the lack of resolution, how does it harm both your community and your economy? Thank you, Chairman, and I urge you to come to the CNMI also and visit us. Uh, the chair and go on. Mariana Islands, but the, the, the stability of, ha of allowing a long-term status, those folks stay on the, si on si on the Mariana Islands and the Northern Marianas. They're not eligible to leave anywhere. So the stability of economic yeah. growth and for all the businesses, that is something that is priceless. On top of that, it, 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 create, it um, holds on the families that are there. And you're looking at uh, families, workers that have been there more than 10, 20 years. Uh, again, it, it does not give them access to anywhere in the U.S., but just stability for the, the company and the business community. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now recognize the gentle lady from American Samoa, Ms. Riley Wagon, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Sablan and Ranking Member Gonzalez Colon for holding this hearing today. And also, thank you, Representative Sablan, for your leadership on territorial issues. Special talofa to full committee chairman Grijalva and ranking member Bishop. I also want to welcome Governor Torres, Governor Leon Guerrero, and the rest of the panel. Afade, and thank you for being here. I spent many of my formative years in the Marianas. I have family and friends there, and these islands are near and dear to my heart. Each of the insular territories faces their own unique challenges, and I'm pleased that the committee has seen fit to hold a full committee hearing for the sake of one of the territories. I'm sure we'll have more of these in the future. H.R. 560 may only affect one small chain of islands, but that doesn't make it any less important, and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of Congressman Sablan's bill. My question is for Mr. Mike Sablan. Uh, Mr. Sablan, thank you for bringing a business perspective to today's hearing. You say in your testimony that your company, Triple J, has gone from 70% foreign labor and 30% U.S. 10 years ago to 30% foreign and 70% U.S. labor today. That is exactly the kind of change that many of us would like to see in the Marianas, but are often told that it's not possible. Could you tell us how Triple J was able to transform to a predominantly U.S. workforce when other employers seem to have so much trouble doing that? Thank you, uh, Ms. Congresswoman. It's um, a good question. Uh, th there are several, uh, several things we have done at Triple J to increase the percentage of U.S. workers and in our attempts to fully transition to a uh, a full 100% U.S. worker, work for labor force. Uh, as with all other companies, we, we go to the Department of Labor's website to, to see who may be available on island for the jobs that are available in our company. We, we've done aggressive outreach efforts through, uh, through the papers, through social media. We are a small community, so um, uh, oftentimes we know who's available on island, who just graduated from college, who left another company who might be looking for opportunities. And so a lot of it is word of mouth. Uh, we're very aggressive. We have a, a strong uh, local U.S. Uh, citizen management team, and we coordinate among ourselves. Uh, we don't sit around. We, we, we're very aggressive. Um, we offer competitive wages and a, a, a good benefits package to our workers, a 401k plan. And, and I think through all, all those efforts, uh, uh, we have reached our success. But I, I have to say, in fairness to many other businesses in the CNMI, we have the advantage of size. We are one of the larger companies. We have the resources internally. We have a management team that can coordinate efforts that not all businesses have. 
And I, I feel for them because I know many of the smaller businesses try their best to, to recruit U.S. workers, uh, are unable to. They, they, they don't have the resources like bigger companies do. But, uh, but from the companies that, uh, that we work with, uh, we're very happy with success. Uh, uh, it's a challenge, though, to, to fully transition to 100% U.S. workers, as I mentioned in my, in my testimony. Many of the 30% uh, uh, who work with us have unique skills, uh, experience in our company and our processes, uh, have embedded uh, uh, their, their skills into our businesses, very difficult to replace, but we will continue our best efforts. And I, I'm, I'm concerned, Congresswoman, that, that we will be back to this committee before the 10 years up, and, and hopefully we, we don't ask for any extension, but I'm concerned uh, uh, it doesn't look like a realistic target, but we will do our best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Um, um, so this time, let me I recognize Mr. Hoffman of California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks for your leadership in uh, having this important hearing. I would like to yield the balance of my time uh, to Mr. San Nicolas. The gentleman is recognized for 451. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my colleague for allowing me the opportunity. <clears throat> uh, I first want to begin by extending my thanks to um, Chairman Grijalva for uh, um, helping the insular areas to receive this kind of uh, uh, attention at the committee level. I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Ranking Member Bishop as well for um, uh, his support. Um, the, the insular areas having uh, a vice chair uh, in Mr. K uh, Mr. Sablan is, is a breakthrough for us uh, that we're able to uh, bring these issues to the full committee level. So we're looking forward to the, uh, the changes that we're going to be able to make as a result of that. Um, I also wanted to begin by um, commending uh, the chairman and the prime sponsor of HR 560. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in a very uh, artful way, has uh, addressed what um, would normally be predominantly an immigration question um, by uh, making it be more so a question of the uh, joint resolution to approve the covenant of the Commonwealth, which has now placed it into the uh, hands of this committee uh, predominantly, and uh, has given it uh, an opportunity to be discussed in the context of how it affects territories, as a, in particular, as opposed to how it affects immigration in general. So I wanted to commend uh, Mr. Chairman for that, uh, that, artful, um, that artful authoring of 560. <clears throat> um, I first wanted to begin by um, kind of uh, putting into context uh, how this particular measure and how the conversations from our witnesses um, are very, very unique in the context of the, uh, the greater question of immigration and, uh, and how it affects the American workforce. Um, I know that some of my colleagues uh, are very concerned that um, we don't ever want to be displacing American jobs um, uh, by having um, uh, alien labor uh, just coming in and, and, and taking those jobs away. Uh, but I can attest uh, as a uh, as the delegate from Guam, that that's not the case with respect to our H2B situation. And so I first wanted to officially put on the record um, the intent of um, the testimony from our two governors. Um, is it the intent to displace American jobs um, by seeking to have the H2B situation um, resolved uh, for the territories? Uh, Governor Torres. Thank you, thank you uh, uh, Delegate. Um, Again, we have more U.S. workers today than ever before. We continue to emphasize, and we welcome all U.S. workers. It's not like we're saying, okay, we're limited to a certain amount. We welcome all U.S. workers to come to the islands. It's just not feasible for them to travel down 8,000, we're 8,000 miles away from here. Um, and then also to work on, on wages that, that are not as feasible as you would transferring to the islands. So we continue to, to have other opportunities within our local force. But the truth is, and I'm glad Dr. Goodnick is here, we just don't have enough workforce. Right. We have a population of 55,000. Our tourists just in the last few years have grown up to 700,000. Now, we have 4,000 rooms of hotels. How do you just accommodate workforce? You don't. So we are not denying any U.S. workers, for the record. We welcome all U.S. workers, but in the lack of, we have no other choice but to go to our neighboring islands or neighboring countries to ask for workforce. 
Thank you, you Governor Tor. I'm, I'm sorry, my, my, my time is going to be running out shortly. But So the answer is no, it's not, the intent is not to displace the American workforce. Absolutely not. Governor Leon Guerrero, is the intent to displace the American workforce in our attempt to try and pursue H2B uh, uh, remedy? Absolutely not. The attempt really in getting H2 workers is to expand our economy, is to fortify our economy, is to grow our economy, and it is also to hearten national security on our islands because like uh, Governor Torres here, the workforce, workforce that we have here, even local workforce, uh, is not enough. The demand is very high and the supply is very low, Thank just you. basic economics. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and so in that, in that vein, I just wanted to make it very clear that um, the uh, H2 situation on Guam uh, is exacerbated because for so many years, um, the federal government has been approving these temporary workers and they've actually um, got the industry to be dependent upon those approvals to a point where a local workforce development was not taking place. Now that we've um, flipped those approvals and have been denying them on a regular basis, that workforce is not available. And so we need to take into very fair consideration the fact that we need to gradually build that local workforce capacity before we just cut them off on the H2B denials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. San Nicolas. And uh, just for the record, Mr. San Nicolas and I yesterday got a briefing from USCIS State Department, CBP, um, about this whole situation, and uh, we'll be talking, uh, having that conversation some more. Um, may I recognize Mr. Bishop from um, our ranking member and the first full committee chairman to ever land, set foot on Tinian and Rota. Ah, Thank you. <laughs> but wants to go to Palau. Let's, uh, let's talk about replicating that again sometime in the winter. Um, <laughs> First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here and for bringing this issue to Mr. Sblan, also for bringing this issue to us. Let me make two comments on what I've heard so far. First of all, Mr. Sblan, appreciate your comments. What you wrote, as well as what you said in your testimony, is we view the federal government as a distant force lacking a full understanding of the unique situations that make up our communities. You're not alone. Those of us in the West United States say the same damn thing all the time. <laughs> Secondly, Ms. Ms. Gonzalez, you also complained about not having senators to help us out. I want you to know having senators ain't that much of a help in the first place. <laughs> so for this particular issue, we've talked about this before, it's very significant. I understand the details of it. Ms. Grijalva, I would urge you to have a markup on these two bills as soon as possible. And even though the H-2B issue is not in the jurisdiction of this committee, I'd be more than happy to work with you on a letter to judiciary to see if they can take that up and, and solve that kind of type of situation. And, Mr. Sablon, governors, <clears throat> I'd love another invitation to go back there again. <laughs> and this time, if we can do it, when we go to Rhoda, just as a heads up, there's a wonderful opportunity for a park there in Rhoda, right? Yes, Could you come to Guam, too? <laughs> Um, Madeline wouldn't allow me not to, <laughs> but we'd have a different discussion on what protocol actually means this time <laughs> around. Right? I appreciate it very much. This is, I think, a significant issue. Thank you for bringing it up again. Let's see if we can work on this at, at the same time. I'll yield my remaining time to Mr. Mr. Gomer. Well, I just wanted to echo what our uh, Republican leader has said here. Uh, we appreciate your being here. Um, Obviously, this is, when we're talking about H-2B visas, this is a totally different situation, and you've done a great job of outlining how different it is from continental U.S., and so I appreciate the education on that. I was reviewing the materials last night, your statements and all, and so you've given me an education, and uh, I am on the Judiciary Committee. I'm not normally in favor of expanding uh, visas like we're talking about, but for the Marianne Islands, it sounds like a, a very good idea, and look forward to helping how I can. So, you will back my time to Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, oh, my God. Uh, my prayers are answered, Mr. Goldman. Go <laughs> <laughs> Chairman Bishop, uh, we'll help you with the paperwork, sir, immediately. Thank you. Uh, Okay, um, at this time, Mr. Levin for five minutes. 
Thank you, uh, Chair Grijalva. I appreciate you organizing today's hearing. Thank you to my friend from the Marianne Islands, uh, our Vice Chair, Mr. Sablan, uh, for your leadership on this issue. I'm grateful to serve with you on this committee uh, and on the Veterans Affairs Committee as well. And thank you to our witnesses. Uh, your testimony today has once again clarified the urgent need to address immigration reform. Uh, our conversation today serves as another example of how this administration's policy towards immigrants is hurting, not helping our communities. Now, small businesses in my district are struggling due to labor shortages exacerbated by this administration. As the governor mentioned, FEMA and their disaster relief and rebuilding efforts are struggling to find enough labor. Uh, we must do more to address these labor shortages, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle on this important issue. Governor Torres, in your remarks, you brought up the powerful statistics that 52% of your population lives beneath the federal poverty line and stated that your residents' economic prosperity is heavily impacted by the Marianas' limited access to labor. Uh, how does H.R. 560 uh, specifically address this, and how else can we in Congress help address the serious labor shortage that the Marianas face? Thank you very much. Let me just say again, uh, give me uh, give an example. A hotel has 150 employees. 50 of them are foreign workers. If we lose that foreign workers, the hotel will shut down, losing 100 U.S. workers. So again, that is, that's how important this bill is in concept. Uh, and, and not just that, though, but imagine the opportunities for the CNMI, our GDP has grown since 2016 and 17, highest in the nation. But because of this shortfall of labor, we are afraid that, and we're certain that the economy will, will drastically decline year after year. And so it is important that we have this, this bill passage. Congressman. Thank you, Governor. I uh, also wanted to thank you for highlighting the impact of the typhoon on your community. Uh, what can we do in Congress? How else can we support your community's efforts to rebuild? The truth is, just allow the flexibility, and that is the biggest thing that we need, is flexibility and allow us to get our workers, foreign workers, to come to the islands to rebuild homes, schools, our, our hospitals, our, our infrastructure. Every day that we don't have our, our homes being built for these folks, they still live in a tent with all their, their belongings next to them. So every day that we don't have construction workers, and I'm not talking about the schools, I'm not talking about the hospital, just folks who, who needs help more than, than we do. And those are the folks that we're fighting for. That's why I flew 8,000 miles hmm. away to come to this body and let you know that as we speak today, we have more than 2,800 tents that people are living in there. And I urge you and I thank you for that question and I look forward to working with you. And please come to the island so you know and you will feel why we're here. Thank, thank you, you, Governor. I appreciate that invitation and uh, I'll yield back the balance of my time to our Vice Chair. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Levin, Ms. Colon. More what questions? I'm yeah, I just I just want to I just want to say to uh, congratulate the first governor, women governor of uh, Guam, for your uh, leadership as well. We went with then chairman uh, Bishop to all the islands, and uh, it was a complete different story knowing what's going on on site, boots on the ground, than actually reading about it. Um, and, and that's the reason uh, when you come here and you just explain the reasons of. You don't have enough workers uh, to make things happen. Um, make a lot of sense to make those kind of changes. Um, so in that regard, I, I do want to just add, in terms of, uh, there's two bills, H uh, 559 and uh, 560. And we know the letter of Homeland Security just established uh, kind of the support for the uh, 559. Um, and I think it's important to establish the difference of how many people will be affected uh, or how many people could be protected as well uh, in each of those bills. Uh, the long-term, the alien status that is included in the, in the 560, um, and, and, and the other one, the, the 559. I know you are supporting both of the bills, governors, Governor Torres and Governor uh, Guerrero. 
Yes. Of the bills. Um, Although the, the two bills don't really affect our island, but I am very much in support of Governor Torres's and uh, his, his plight and his uh, passion and message to make sure that uh, his labor force and workforce and people are regarded as permanent uh, CNMI uh, citizens, yes. And one last question in that regard. All requirements under the Administrative Procedure Act delays workers from receiving the resident status today. We, for the, the bill, I'm in support for them to be long-term status to stay in the CNMI and not be able to go outside the CNMI. That just brings more stability for the economic reason for businesses as well as families. And uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Gutnick, if we go to the judicial process, that will slow down uh, the process as well, correct? Well, what I can tell you is you've, you've mentioned 559 and 560. Mm -hmm. So 560 has provisions for six categories of individuals and 559 covers four of the six categories. In 560, the, the, the bill includes long-term workers, individuals who've been continuously employed for three years or more. Uh, that number is about 2,900. Uh, there are other provisions and other requirements in HR 560 that could limit that number. Uh, there are only about 50 or so, uh, the, 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 the other category is, is uh, CNMI only investors. There are about 50 CNMI investors who remain uh, uh, under that program. Um, the, the first four categories, which are the, the parents, children, and spouses of U.S. citizens and permanent residents at the time of the transition, that's the vast majority of the individuals, a total of 1,000 or so. Thank you. I'll be back. Well, thank you very much. Um, at this time, um, Mr. Horsford, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be brief. Uh, before the ranking member leaves, I will just say, um, that after hearing his remarks and uh, offer of support of the legislation uh, to the chairman um, and to you, Mr. Sablan, uh, that I just really wanted to voice uh, my uh, support uh, for this legislation, uh, thank the governors uh, and the witnesses for being uh, here today. Um, my colleague, uh, Mr. St. Nicholas, is someone who I respect. He is help to bring attention to a number of important issues as you, Mr. Sablan, and um, I would like to yield the balance of my time uh, to Mr. St. Nicholas if you would like any additional time. Now, Mr. St. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and just um, um, thank you to my colleague for your very kind words and for your support for the territories. Um, we do have a lot of uh, federal inequities that um, need to be brought forward, and I'm looking forward to working with all of my colleagues to make sure we address them. Um, that being said, and Mr. Chairman, with the presumption, and I hope I'm not being too presumpt presumptuous, but you're also going to allow me another five minutes of my own time. Yes. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. So with that, I would like to um, add the full balance together of these eight minutes and give an opportunity to our two governors who've traveled thousands of miles to be able to use the platform and the record to be able to articulate any other items that are of concern of the territories that you would like to bring forward at this time. Thank you, um, Congressman, for that. Uh, of course, um, I will use every platform to make my message known. The other biggest inequities for the territories is Medicaid. Medicaid is treated as a block grant to the territories. We have a cap of 18 million and our percentage uh, is 5545. We would just like to be treated equally as all the other states in its formulation, and that is formulating it under per capita per income rather than outright block grant. We would also like to extend the expanded ACA to the territories as it expires in September of 2019. Um, and we have 61 million yet that we need to uh, use. 
The other one, and I'll make this really fast, is EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit. This is a federally unfunded mandate for the territories, Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And this is where we pay, the e we're mandated to pay Earned Income Tax Credit, but use it out of our general fund where everyone else has uh, uh, been paid by the federal government. And I did bring this up to President Trump, and President Trump said to me, I think we should pay for this. So I am here to get my EITC paid also, legislative, administrative-wise. Um, thank you. Um, I'll give Governor Torres time. Yeah, again, and the Medicaid issue is, is, is across, is across the, the, um, the insular areas. I think this is what I was saying earlier, that the, really Congress and Senate needs to give us that flexibility because we're thousands of miles away, Guam and CNMI, we're the farthest from the Pacific. And so our issues here, although everybody, everybody says they're different, we are not just different, we're very unique, and that we should be given that flexibility. Um, in, same thing with the, um, the FEMA recovery. You're giving us hundred millions of dollars. If we're not able to have workforce, how are we gonna do the repair that you're mandated? On one federal government is saying, here's millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars, on the other federal partners say, hold on, you're not able to, to get the resources you need. Uh, but we're the one who's being affected. So again, thank you for this time and the opportunity. Please give us that flexibility. And just treat us fairly. That's what we ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the two governors for sharing some perspective on some of the challenges that we face. Uh, I'd just like for my colleagues to know for the record that there are, are a whole host of other federal challenges that we're having to uh, to deal with. I'm sure Mr. Pula um, you know, can account for a, a whole litany of them, um, ranging from such things as the compacts of free association and the, and the, um, the costs associated with that, uh, the need for us to get a fair and equitable reimbursement on the cost of treaties that we have no say in, um, we also have issues with respect to just making sure that um, Guam is being included in a whole host of um, legislation and uh, federal programs that oftentimes um, Guam gets left out of, as well as the CNMI. Um, so we do have a lot of work to do to be able to make sure the territorial causes advance, not to the plate, not to a place where we're trying to get something that you know is not due, but to a place where we're just at, at, at equity with the rest of everywhere else in America. And um, I can assure um, the governors that uh, my colleagues are, are very much attuned to that. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for allowing uh, a window um, for a platform for our governors to be able to articulate many of their concerns um, through the use of, uh, of the hearing that we have here today. It was very generous of you, sir, to allow for your hearing to, to become a platform. And I think that that's uh, the, very, the very kind of uh, leadership that um, the territories can look forward to from all of your territorial delegates. We're going to, as, many, as often as possible, give you as much of a platform to be able to articulate our, our case. So, uh, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Sniklaus, and you still have five, uh, five minutes if you want. <laughs> Any of, my gov any of our governors have uh, anything else they'd like to add with respect to any other federal concerns to just put on the record? And he's just a freshman and he's figured that out, so. <laughs> well, I, I'll say is I think this is our closing and I was looking at it, you have more, more minutes. And, uh, well, I just want to say again, Dr. Uh, Zuzmasi for giving us this opportunity uh, to come out here and really have that dialogue. And this insular areas, uh, and I love what Nick said, uh, Mr. Pula, the insular areas is here to fight for our needs. We are here echoing those needs. Uh, and it comes to a point where it's really a matter of life and death. And the longer we prolong this, the longer the recovery will be and people will continue to suffer. And I know and have every confidence, and I'm, I, we just got a great news from Chairman Bishop about how to move forward and moving forward. Congressman uh, St. Nicholas, congratulations. And I wanna say thank you and I look work, uh, forward working with you as well as uh, our chairman and vice chairman, Congressman Kilili, and Dr. Loki and Jesus Masi for a tour of Zudu, especially at Estienna Asunto, Jesus Masi, and Gilisau. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman St. Nicholas, and also um, Congressman Samla. And I also would like to just say that there are a lot of federal issues 
um, two top ones that I also I'm making as a priority for my administration is compact impact reimbursements, which uh, we have been so duly inequitably reimbursed for. We have over about one point one point four billion dollars worth of costs and impact to our island, our hospital, our educational system, our safety, and so forth. So we would like the help of the Congress to try and figure out something and how we can best move forward to try and recoup our uh, our costs through federal government. And the other one, of course, is the war claims, where we are feverishly waiting for the um, glitch to be repaired. Uh, and I know Congressman Nicholas has introduced legislation to get that working. Uh, but I've also been talking administratively to see how we can resolve it also from an administrative. I just want to say also thank you, and Sidhu Smasi, for this opportunity. And you have two great governors that are out there also in the islands that are working just as hard to improve the quality of uh, life like you are working over here from a federal level. So we love the partnership that we are, we are having, and we rely on your help to help us be economically sufficient and uh, independent in working out our challenges. And I just want to say the H2B issue is really an economic issue and a national security issue for our islands and not necessarily a framework of immigration reform. Thank you again. And uh, your uh, state is country is very cold, so I can't wait to go home to my warm island. Thank you. Um, thank you to the governors for, for again, um, providing some clarity. And Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to close on the, on the war claim statement by our governor. Um, a thanks to the full committee uh, and, and the full committee staff, as well as to uh, the full committee chair um, for their assistance and guidance in crafting various alternatives to be able to address that war claims concern. Uh, just yesterday, we've introduced a second measure um, that would attempt to try and uh, move this thing through. Um, our first attempt was to either create, was to craft the actual appropriation um, our second attempt is to, was to not require an appropriation altogether. And so we'll see how we can, we can move this forward. But with the assistance of the, of, of the chairman and the full chairman of the full committee, um, we were able to uh, get the guidance necessary to craft the language to also place that legislation into this committee. So hopefully we can, we can expedite it even further. But Mr. Chairman, again, Sijus Maasi for allowing us to have this platform. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. And, um be very sincere uh, before I close, uh, before we close, um, that um, getting the chairman, we have a commitment to help getting Mr. Goldmart's commitment to help on an immigration issue. As, um, yeah, I've been, prayers are answered. Um, if we could get it done, of course, we still need the administrations. And we will continue working with them just like we agreed yesterday uh, in the briefing. But uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, um, I, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the committees uh, may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to this in writing. Under Committee Rule 3.0, members of the committee must sub submit written questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. And if there's uh, no further Can business... Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, I just want to add something. Uh, to what the governors and uh, Representative uh, San Nicolas just said. It is important for the territories uh, to get equal access uh, to all federal programs. And we many times, many times are discriminated in that sense. Uh, we all together, uh, all the delegates from the territories, uh, we file HR 947 uh, to provide SSI for all territories. And at the same time, um, I'm a co-sponsor of HR 2 eight of Mr. San Nicolas just for uh, Guam. Uh, at the same time, we filed uh, HR 754, providing ATC for Puerto Rico. So we will be more than glad uh, to, to have a separate or sponsor bill for um, the islands as well. Same thing happened with the child tax credit. 
so we we file HR 302 uh, for Puerto Rico, and all the territories has been are all uh, sponsors of these bills. Uh, so we are promoting that for the rest of the territories as well. So this is just a few of the items uh, that I think are important uh, for the agenda of the territories as well, including data collection um, in all federal agencies, because without that, uh, all, all money sometimes is discretionary from the officials. Uh, I just want to add uh, that, because Mr. Sablan um, and all the territories delegates, uh, as we did in the past with Ms. Bordalo, we're doing that now uh, as a team effort for the islands as well. Thank you, Nigel Back. Thank you, and uh, I'd also like to recognize the chairman. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Sablan, I just want to thank you, and uh, you know the, the the idea as we discussed was that a, a full committee would afford an opportunity to highlight what doesn't get highlighted, which is the issues uh, relative to the territory and the insular areas, and and uh, and I and I think it's doing exactly that. And, and, and I would appreciate the witnesses for being here. As we go forward and deal with the issue of fairness and equity, that uh, all of you that, represent, that ably represent these areas have brought up time and time again, uh, there's gonna be a variety of ways. Standalone legislation, uh, part of something else as we move forward. But the issue of equity, beginning with Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, ending with other things are, are something that's doable either as a standalone or see what we can influence with other pieces. But uh, that's the intent and uh, I wanna thank you and then we'll continue to put, you guys continue to put the agenda together and uh, we'll Sorry. be there to deal Sorry. with it. And Mr. Chairman, and as we talk about parity also, I wanna thank you uh, for working in the past two years in the background uh, and with the, our, Say our, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee on the lands bill that uh, uh, because in that bill we've been able to, and Ms. Bordalio may also like to hear this, that we, you have been able to get the territories uh, a state share of yeah. the Land uh, Conservation Water Fund. Um, we've always had to have a state share shared among four uh, insular areas. Now we have a state share for each of the insular area, so the, the amount of money has actually increased. Uh, if that becomes law, it's, it's, it's a, it was an effort that has been in this committee for several Congresses, but it's now uh, in a package that was passed by the Senate, and so we look forward to it becoming enacted into law. If there's um, no further business, uh, again, uh, okay. Uh, and without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Boss. <laughs> Sublime. <laughs> Thank you.